Ephesians from chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And the first thing I want to say before we, before we read is um, you should notice if you pick up a Bible and just look at uh, any copy of the Bible, the first thing you should notice about it is that it's divided into two parts, uh, divided into uh, sections that are marked, uh, marked old and new, Old Testament and New Testament. It's divided, in other words. That's really the first thing you should notice about uh, the Bible and the first uh, clue to understanding and to uh, interpreting and understanding what's going on. That is to say that the, the two parts uh, signify that there's a difference between what's old and what's new. And we should take that into account. Now, most Christians, I'm sorry to say, uh, tend to want to smooth that difference over and to, and to make it all be the same and to try to make it be a continuity. And there's reasons for doing that to, make it, to avoid any possible sense of contradictions. But I think that's a big mistake because you end up with a kind of a schizophrenic uh, way of living uh, because things are different in the Old Testament. In fact, everything is different. It's not that God is different, but his way of dealing with humanity is completely different. And everything about man's relationship with God is different in the New Testament in which we live than the Old Testament which we read about. The difference being Jesus. Uh, this is the Christmas season, of course, and we s celebrate at that time. We could say, in one way of saying it, you know, when we see the manger scenes and the little uh, depictions of Christ's birth, we would tend to say it's the time we celebrate the birth of Christ. But another way to look at it is the coming of Jesus into the world. That's another way to say it. And of course, he had to be born to do that. Uh, the coming of Jesus into the world was what made the difference between uh, Old and New, Old Testament and New Testament. Jesus came into the world on the night that he was born, as you know, if you've ever seen the Charlie Brown Christmas special, uh, when Linus gets up and reads at the end, and they turn the lights off and he reads from Luke's gospel, uh, the angels appeared to shepherds in the field, and what they said was, we bring you uh, good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For unto you this day is born in the city of David a Savior. That's what they said. On the night that Jesus was born, the angels announced his arrival as uh, they announced him as a savior. Now there's a lot of things that you could say about Jesus and there's a lot of things you could say to define his ministry and his life and uh, he did a lot of things. He was a teacher, but the angels didn't say on the night he was born until he was born a teacher. That means his role as savior is first and foremost importance. He came as a savior. Now that, the reason I'm emphasizing that is that if it were possible for us as individuals, as human beings, to make ourselves acceptable to God, to live a life that is acceptable to God, to live a life that's pleasing to God, to be accepted by God based on our own efforts or as some people think of it, the redoubling of our efforts and trying harder. If it were possible for us to do it on our own, then we wouldn't need Jesus as a savior. Just think about that for a moment. If it were possible for us to have a right relationship with God based on our own good behavior and our own good lives and our own righteousness and our own actions as required by the Old Testament, then we wouldn't need a Savior. We wouldn't need Jesus. In fact, Jesus need not have come at all. He need not have been born. He need not have gone to the cross and died carrying our sins in his own body on the tree, as 1 Peter 2.24 says. He need not have come at all. If it were possible for us to live a life that was acceptable to God, Jesus could have stayed put and God could have floated down an 11th commandment saying, try a little harder, folks. But all the trying a little harder wasn't going to cut it, you see. Because let's just say it this way. If God is perfect and he's righteous and perfectly righteous and perfectly holy, the only way you can have a relationship with a perfectly righteous and perfectly holy God is for you to also be perfectly righteous and perfectly holy. Now, if I say it that way, I hope I've presented that as a daunting proposition. In fact, so daunting that uh, if you're honest with yourself, you know that you can never be perfectly righteous or perfectly holy. In fact, I've never met anybody yet who said to me, I'm perfect. <laughs> now, I've never met anybody who told me that. I have a lot of conversations with people. I don't really understand uh, why. I guess uh, something I've said or written somewhere, like in the newspaper, they put little things, rubs them the wrong way, and they want to try to talk me out of it. Or Just uh, last week, I had a fresh one. Somebody wanted to meet with me and talk about uh, you know, some of these things. But I've never met anybody yet who said, you know what, I'm perfect. 
No, what most people say is, I may not be perfect, but I'm better than these people over here. But you see, it's not good enough. It's not good enough to be better than somebody else. God doesn't grade on a curve. To be accepted by God, you've got to be perfect. If God's perfect, to be accepted and have a right relationship with God, however you want to say it, make it into heaven. Somebody called me one time, asked me to come pray for their, uh, a loved one, of their, a, a, a woman who was uh, on her deathbed. De the doctors had said she's going to die soon. She didn't uh, come to our church, and that's okay. I don't mind, uh, but I went to pray for her anyway. I didn't know her personally. That's what I'm saying. I knew the, the children of this woman. So uh, she went to another church. Uh, it, in fact, I asked her when I went to pray with her, uh, I said, are you a Christian? And she said, oh, I've, been, I've gone to church all my life. I never miss. And uh, so I said, well, can I pray for you? And then she began to kind of tear up a little bit. And she said, I just, listen to this. She said, I just hope I've done enough good things to make it in. Now, she knew the doctors had said she's going to die soon. And she had no confidence at all that she would be accepted by God. She said to me, I hope I've done enough good things to make it in. Now, that's, uh, those words mean I feel insecure about it. I feel unsure. Now, uh, I, I think a lot of people feel that way. And I would like to say, I, it's, it's sad, but it's probably because she's been in church all her life. She probably heard in church, we tend to hear a lot of emphasis on you, what you do, what you're supposed to do, what the requirements are, what you're supposed to do. And the problem with that is it creates this impression that um, God is expecting you to conform to some kind of a standard, and if you don't conform, then he's not going to accept you. Now, that is, as a matter of fact, pretty much the message of the Old Testament. The Old Testament is all about thou shalt and thou shalt not, and it's all about you, all about the individual and what the person, what the human individual in that covenant does for God, about you and what you do for God. However, when we come to the New Testament, there's something different. There's a complete change. That's why it's divided, old and new. There's a complete different message, completely different message. In the New Testament, instead of saying, here's what you do for God, the New Testament presents the message, here's what God has done for you. You see what's different about it? Jesus came to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. And God, of course, was in on it too, working with him. The New Testament, the message of the New Testament is all about what God has done for us, not what we do for God. Now, I wanted to illustrate that by reading to you the first part of Ephesians chapter 1. I see Alex has left the room, so uh, he's, he's just like Elvis. He's left the building. But, no, he hadn't left the building. But, he just, but he'll be back in a minute, and he'll put it up on the screen for you. But I want to read to you um, the King James translation in Ephesians chapter 1. Now, this is Paul the Apostle. He's writing to a group of Christians in Ephesus. And um, he starts off this way in the King James translation. He says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints that are at Ephesus and the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. Now that's the King James translation of the first three verses. And as you can tell, it's, it's a little bit wordy and it's in King James English, which is 400 years old. King James translation was made in 1611. We don't exactly speak today just like they spoke in 1611. And so I'd like to read these, these, these verses and the verses that follow from uh, not the King James translation. We could read them both and then compare them, but I just want to skip to um, this one called the Message Translation, which I like. It's in modern English. The translator of the Message Translation uh, is a Presbyterian minister named Eugene H. Peterson. And he made this translation after spending his life as a pastor uh, preaching from the King James translation and he said uh, that he found himself spending most of his time in his sermons explaining what words meant and explaining archaic usages of words. Some of the words uh, have changed their meaning uh, in the course of 400 years. And so he said to himself, instead of spending all my time explaining what all the words mean in this King James translation, I should just put it into an ordinary, put it into book form, and then I won't have to at least spend so much time explaining. I'll just get the message across. So the message translation, just like the name implies, gets the message across. So just to make this point, and I'll stop every now and then just to reiterate what the point is, here's the point. The point is the New Testament is not about what you do for God. It's about what God does for you, what he has done for you. It's not about you and your obligations. It's about God and his